well equipped. Just Jay Wall and Uncle Gene this week. Again, I don't think anybody else is coming back. It's been three weeks since RB's been on the pod. Uh, two weeks, maybe three. I can't keep up with, with Serial Killer's schedule now that he's on vacation. I, I think they've just left it to us, Uncle Gene. They're going to let us burn this place to the ground. Was it uh, something I said? <laughs> I have to go back and listen because as coach, we, we have this group chat to kind of semi-organize this pirate ship. But uh, I guess my my rant against you last week reached his uh, highlight reel it was going so after great. me on social media. And so uh. the funniest part is I listened to the damn thing. I listened to it with my girlfriend and I was like, I don't remember this. <laughs> and we're like 35 <laughs> minutes in. And she's like, and she keeps waiting for me to say, the worst part was she kept waiting for me to say something offensive. And every time I'd start a sentence, she's like, oh, this is going to be the one that you do it. <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't always say offensive things, just occasionally. And so finally, just I had me. To, finally, I had to text and go, when is this magical moment coming up? And of course, I was like three minutes off. I was going to say, was you, like, oh, you were very oh. close. Yeah you, yeah, you were like two minutes and 30 seconds out from, from hearing it. Uh, it's funny. I always wonder how many people listen to the whole pod. And, and this, this past week, I had multiple people reach out to me and go, man, Gene, Gene lets you have it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, he did. I, it was warranted. It was warranted. I made him sound like an old. So, oh god, that fair, was fair play, Uncle Gene. You, yeah, you, you well, let me have it. It was. It was I, like, I, it listen, was I listened to it and I was like, "Ooh, somebody hit a soft spot there, <laughs> <laughs> Mister Social Media." I didn't realize that. Well, you got to understand. So, I was born in 1966. In 1964 was the end of the baby boomers, mm -hmm. and so my kids. And you're, you're about to enter this phase, Jay Wall. My kids, when they were like 13, 14, 15, and I, you know, yell at them about something in regard to technology or something, they're just gut punched to me was they go, okay, boomer. Thanks, boomer. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not a boomer. <laughs> and the more I said, I'm not a boomer, the, and I just realized. More I was reinforced, like, I'm, you are a boomer. I, I'm like, I'm like, I'm being bullied by my young teenage children. So, yeah. Mm. So, there's, there's a little bit of scar <laughs> tissue there. No kidding. No <laughs> kidding. Uh, well, Xander Shoffley is your, your open champion. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you get a chance to watch any of the coverage? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, he he played a flawless round on Sunday. Little little background to Xander. I've never met Xander, but I used to work with his old man all the time, Stefan. Oh man, what was <laughs> what? What's your relationship like with him? And I'll tell you what mine is. So I hadn't seen Stefan in twenty five years, and I saw him at the Open at Tory. And I, I didn't even know if he'd remember me, but we we hung out. This was when I used to test at the polo fields, and he had just was just getting into golf, and, um, and he was working with a few different brands. That dude is a character and a half, and we used to just sit out there and tell stories. And so, uh, anyway, so I ran into him at the, and it was funny. It was Father's Day. It was Sunday of the of the U.S. Open, and so. I'm just like, what are you up to now? And he's like, you know, I'm managing my son and everything. I'm like, congratulations for winning the genetic lottery. <laughs> <laughs> well, the crazy thing about Xander is that he wasn't even he wasn't even a great a great golfer growing up because I've, I've talked to mm -hmm. I've talked to to the Toulons before Toulon boys, and you know Joe's Joe's working out on the the PJ tour with Callaway, and they remember playing junior golf with Xander and they, they will, they were the ones that say, I mean, look, he wasn't a great player. He, he would shoot in the eighties and you know, he, he was, you know, have a couple of good rounds and it was all of a sudden he, like the light switch flipped on and he became a stud. But yeah, for, for a while he was just, just the never guy. And the, the wild thing about Xander just kind of standing next to him or being around him is physically you'd be like, there's no way that guy's a professional athlete. I mean, he's just, you know, he's he, at least Rory. Rory's not the tallest guy, but he's buff. 
Xander's just, I mean, he just looks like a dude and, and it's like, but his, his physical abilities are just like you said. And, you know, I was watching some social media this last week and I like how um, you emphasize that. (laughs) And there was some old clips of him, you know, kind of being interviewed and they're like, you know, what do you need to do to get your game to the next level? And he's like, just win on the big stage, you know, just close. And he knew he had the ability. And that's what's fascinating about these guys. And I'm always intrigued by like a run like Scheffler's. Tiger's run, you know, is the run of all runs. But, you know, a, an interesting run is a guy like Jordan Spieth. What did he win? Four majors? I can't, I can't remember the exact number. But you know, the word on the street about Spieth was he just couldn't keep up that intensity for that long to do that, whereas Tiger could. And Xander's in that in that flow right now, and it'll be real interesting to see because it's, man, that requires a lot of mental and physical effort to, to stay on that. But he's in that groove like Scheffler was, and it's just, it's really wild for me to see this game that is so humbling and brings people to their knees to see someone excel on that mountaintop and do they have the drive to continue that? And it's just, yeah. you know, it's going to be a fascinating story to watch going forward. So for tell sure. me your, tell me your uh, interactions with Stefan. Oh, well, I mean, the most, the most recent I was at the, when the match play was in Austin and, you know, being out on tour, I'm, I'm usually digging the guys bags. And I ask, I ask the player or the caddy before I start, you know, manhandling the golf clubs and, I was shooting Xander's gear and I could feel somebody behind me as I'm shooting, you know, cause I'm just, I'm like, I've got my, I'm got my camera in front of me. I'm, you know, click, 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 click. And I'm like, God, what? So I turn around and it's Stefan and he goes, and he's a big dude. He's too. a big dude. And he's like, and I'm, I mean, I'm six, five and right, but he's, right. he's, he's a big guy. And he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I couldn't tell if he, cause I've talked to him before. I couldn't tell if he's being serious or not. I'm like, Hey, this stuff, I'm just taking pictures. And he's like, okay, well, I'm just make, watching you to make sure that you don't, you don't ding up any of the clubs. And I could tell at that point he was he was joking, and uh, and like I would still pretend to like throw it back down into the bag when I was done. But he is he. I mean, you nailed it. He's a character. And every time that I've that I've seen him, and he's like, oh, don't mess with the clubs. Don't don't mess them up. And I'm like, I, I know, I know. But it's so funny because I think I've told this story before on the podcast. Um, years ago when I was still working for the PGA tour and I, uh, in San Antonio walked down with Ricky Fowler's bag to shoot. It was walking back up into the Cobra truck and tripped on the top step and the bag spilled out. And, uh, and Joe Scoven, his caddy at the time and Ricky were in the Cobra truck as I, <laughs> as the club spill out. So anytime somebody says to me like, Hey, be careful with, with, with the tools. I'm like, I have like PTSD because that's like, it, tr- it triggers you. Oh, 100%. 100%. Um, yeah, but so I want to ask you Xander now has two major wins this year. He's played 18 events, two major wins, two runners up. Uh, he's finished in the top 25 17 times. Okay, that's one resume. The other is 16 events played, six wins, one of those being a major with 15 top 25s. If you were to look at those resumes, uh, like in a, you didn't know who the other guy was, A or B, whose season are you taking? Oh, Xander's hands down. Hands down. Because yeah, you, win, you win two majors. I mean, that's... That, yeah, 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 that's yeah. And, and yeah. with this... That's all that really matters in the end. With, with this bifurcation of the professionals, you know, I mean, poor Scotty. And it was really interesting. I, I went back and looked at uh, Scheffler's, like, scores versus tournament averages of some of his scores. And he's right there, if not under um, the tournament average to win the tournament. Cause you know, that's kind of the, that's kind of the marker year to year. Um, obviously it's a little weather dependent and course setup, but for the most part, it's a good kind of metric, but the big X factor in Scheffler, unfortunately in his, in all of his success is the pressure of playing against some of the best in the world that are that are putting pressure on him and um it, there's nothing he can do about it you know it's just he's playing in the pga and this is the way that it is 
But for Xander to win on two major stages against the best in the world from both leagues, I think that just it it, it has to elevate him to player of the year. I mean, yeah, there's I, just, I there's, was, I'm yeah. in total agreement with you. I think the you nailed it. He played against the best players in the world, all of them. And, you know, I think Bryson's right up there. You know, he had he had a rough week at Royal Troon, but when he's in form like he was at the at the PGA, you know, you beat a guy like that in in his incredible his prodigious distance, you know, that's that is worth more than than a couple of tour wins, in my opinion. So yeah, yeah he, Bryce, he, gets, he gets player of the year. If Bryson wins PGA, he's player of the year. I mean, that's the well, assu- he, assuming assuming you could actually get you could, you could compel <laughs> Monahan to give him player of the year. Yeah, he's not getting it. Good. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I didn't quite I didn't quite think that logic tree through far. They're going to they're going to send him a tin foil uh, <laughs> Jack Nicholas trophy. <laughs> Here you go, Bryson. Well, how embarrassing would that be if you know two of the majors are won by by a live guy? But I mean, you know. Well, I mean, I mean there's there's a lot of people that we're talking about when when Brooks won another major, and everybody was like, "Man, these guys aren't you know their their games didn't fall off a cliff." I mean, some of them yeah. did. John Rahm, my gosh, what the heck happened to him? Um, that's another story for another day. But yep. there are some of those live pros that are are finding a way to contend in the majors even when they're not playing a a rigorous tour schedule. Now again, they're private contractors; they can play what they want, but. I'm, I can tell you Bryson would have been playing a lot more golf than what he's been playing just on, on the live tour alone. So um, the interesting one uh, to me is Cam Smith. I mean, that's you know, another guy whose game yeah, has just disappeared. I just don't hear anything. I mean, yeah. I don't know if he's spending yeah. most of his time fishing in Florida. Probably. Which Why not? Do, you know, I know, but <laughs> it's just for life. <laughs> I know it's just interesting. It's like, you know, and that was the kind of the criticism of live and we won't go too far down that rabbit hole, but it's like, you know, I, I've always been kind of against not paying players that don't make the cut because, you know, you have all these expenses to show up. You're part of an entertainment organization. But now I'm kind of understanding it a little bit in relation to live that I never thought about. And that's, man, you're a lot hungrier and you're a lot more neurotic and you're a lot more on edge if you don't make the cut and know that, you know, now not for the top 10 that are flying in private jets and, you know, those expenses are minimal. But for a lot of these guys, man, that really is a big motivator to go out there and lay it on the line every week and try to give the best product possible. So it's it's just an, an interesting, I think, unintended consequence of making someone obscenely wealthy yeah. is that they, they can lose that edge that you know, allows motivation. Them. Yeah, motivation. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. All right, before we get into Xander's golf ball. I want to do a little bit of a mini deep dive into that. I want to let you know that Fully Equipped is brought to you by our good friends at Golf Pride and their extensive line of golf grips. We talk about all the different grips that they have in their lineup, and a lot of them are the the club grips and also the reverse taper putter grip. But I just, today, Gene, I was actually going through their website. And if you, and I kind of mentioned this last week for Fairway Jockey, sometimes you just forget about the, the different aspects the really cool aspects of some of these websites and for golf prides if you go to to golfpride.com you can go to the the top toolbar to grips and you can shop by different categories you've got your swing grips your putter grips they have regripping supplies as well Um, but you can also shop by feel which i think is is something a lot of golfers don't always consider is like how do you want your golf grips to feel do you want your golf grip to feel soft do you like a tackier feel to your golf grips uh, maybe a hybrid, more like a, a new decade multi compound. Do you like a, a firmer feel to your grips, which is something that a lot of tour pros are able to to create by taking some of these, you know, even whether it's a standard or a mid side and building it up with wraps of tape underneath. Uh, um, you know that that is a way to create a firmer feel with your golf grip. So anyway, go check out all the different ways that you can kind of customize your golf grips it's it's not just the one-stop shop where you just go there you click you buy a grip golf pride does a really nice job of kind of walking you through that process with all their different grips and, and asking those questions so that you're actually picking a golf grip that's going to benefit your game um, one of the grips that is not part of the the standard lineup that i do want to highlight today is golf pride's collaboration with steph curry and underrated um, they created a collab grip that i mean this this thing is pretty cool i'm a basketball fan um love steph curry he's a really good dude he gives back to the community um 
huge golfer, as a lot of people know. And so they created this custom grip with, with Steph's influences. And each grip set that you purchase is going to help support underrated golf and its mission to provide greater equity and access and opportunity to student athletes. Um, you get 13 of these Steph Curry inspired MCC plus four grips. These grips, again, were designed by Steph. Um, you also get a custom collab ball marker in a display box. There's going to only be 8,200 of these individually numbered kits that are going to be available. They're $249.99. Some people are going to say that that's crazy expensive for grips, but like, go take a look at these. Like they have Steph Curry's logo on them. The, the coins, the markers alone are really cool. The, the box, they did a really nice job on that. So anyway, go check them out if you're interested in kind of getting one of those. Limited releases nowadays are huge. Everybody wants a limited release, and Golf Pride's doing it in a really fun way with Steph Curry. So go check it out. And as always, if you want to learn more about Golf Pride's grips, again, that's golfpride.com. Thanks again to them for supporting Fully Equipped. Well, right. it, it, let me let me jump into one thing real quick about Golf Pride, and yeah. uh, and I think that our our listeners, viewers on YouTube, it's really important that you know, from my perspective, um, there's there's some serious performance advantages to grips, and one of them is um, the the size of your grip as far as closure rotation. So a club goes from open to close through impact, and if you have quick hands, a bigger grip can help slow that handle down oh, yeah. and, and, and reduce against that. So there are actual physics that are involved in the grip that, that can do that. And the second aspect, especially for any anyone uh, you know consuming this that's over the age of 55, 60, is grips can be energy absorbing. And if you've been playing a lifetime of golf and suddenly you're developing golfer's elbow or a shoulder injury or something from all of the repetitive stress of impacts, bigger, more absorbing and grips that absorb more energy can help reduce injuries as well. You're exactly um, right. And so there's, there's some real kind of performance and also uh, biomechanical um, advantages to looking at grips. They're not just feel alone or looks it's um you, you your grip is it's it's part of the overall profile of your equipment setup and it shouldn't be ignored it should be emphasized as one of the things you're looking for because this is a game of one or two strokes makes a major difference in kind of your overall outlook as an amateur yeah yeah no it's it's very good food for thought and it's certainly an aspect of of the fitting process, as you mentioned, that isn't really considered. And I, I think that's a huge miss by a lot of golfers out there. But again, I don't think that it's it's an indictment on the golfer more so as as like we have to do a better job of informing, of, of informing golfers of of these benefits of, as you mentioned, like using a larger grip if you want to if you want to slow down closure rate. Like this yep. is an option. You don't always have to blame it on the, the club head or the shaft. Sometimes it's just a small tweak, like, you know, just, just try it, just try one, try a larger grip and see if it helps your game out. That's it's, yep. it's as simple as that. Um, all right. So when a guy wins two majors in a year, and I don't know if you saw, I think Xander's in a category where I, I'm, and I'm going to botch this. I think there's like seven, maybe seven guys in, in the history of the game who've ever had a season where they've won two majors and finished inside the top 10 in the other two that they didn't win. Xander won, as we mentioned, the PGA, wins the Open, finished eighth at the Masters in T7 at the US Open. Um, it's just stupid good season. And for for me being a gear guy, Uncle Gene, I, I start to like look at what is different in his bag from last year to this year. I know gear is only a very small part of the the you know the improvement process for Xander. Xander's gotten even though he does look like an every guy, he has gotten stronger, he's gotten faster, and and that certainly helps when you're longer off the tee. But one of the things that I wanted to zero in on is is the Callaway Chrome Tour golf ball that he switched to this year, um, which is kind of funny because if you go back to the Century Tournament of Champions, Xander was asked about his golf ball. And he said the the golf ball is identical, meaning like when he switched from Chrome Soft X to Chrome Tour, 
He's like, yeah, the golf ball is identical. I think they just stamped a new logo on it, which is, you know, when you're a spokesperson for, for, a, for a brand, <laughs> you're like, oh, that's probably not what you want to say. Uh, but this golf ball, having talked to Xander more recently, he's like, look, this this ball does something that I couldn't do with my with my Chrome Soft X, which is it has this without getting again too too much in the weeds. If you want to learn more about the Chrome Tour balls, we we've, we've done a pretty extensive deep dive on it on golf.com. Um, but they have this new seamless tour aero package where they were able to to refine the dimple design on this golf ball and it's able to to really cut through that wind. So you're not having to do the mental math, as I said in a story that I wrote this week on, on Xander's ball. It, it really allows him to just point, click, and shoot and know that that ball is going to hang on the line that he's intending. And, and I look at a shot on Sunday's final round on 11. He had 173 to the hole. He's in the you know some high grass. And it wasn't like a, a juicy lie, but it, you know it still requires a little bit of, of math to realize like, okay, I got a flyer lie. I got a, a win coming out of the left at 17 miles an hour almost a, like a straight crosswind, maybe a little bit helping, which probably in a situation like that when you got a flyer lie is not a good thing. And that ball, he landed it perfectly on the front edge of the green, rolled it up to probably two feet. It was, in my opinion, probably the best shot of, of the day for him. He was two shots back at the lead at that time. Um, and I just thought about it. I'm like, man, th this is a situation where he, he sees the wind, but you could tell he wasn't really playing for it. He just aimed where he wanted to aim, and that ball did, did the trick. And Gene, you did testing with with Callaway's Chrome Tour and the, the Chrome Tour X. And, you know, people always ask, like, is, is it really worth it to change golf balls? I just kind of play whatever I want. But there's some pretty compelling evidence that, that Callaway's doing some stuff in the industry right now that nobody else is doing. And I think golfers should probably, I think it's about time for them to stand up and take notice. So uh, I, I, I'm going to go, I'm going to riff on this one a little bit. You gave me a lot, a lot to go on, but let me just start with your <laughs> shot. Um, here's one of the things I've learned, uh, using the foresight, uh, GC quad. If you hit a dead straight shot with an iron with almost no side spin, the wind has minimal effect. It's side spin that adds to it and you can, and you can, so let's just say you have a right to left, uh, uh crosswind. If you have fade spin you can kind of neutralize that that wind a little bit but if you have draw spin it's just it's gone it's just completely gone like the wind will accentuate that and we've done these tests you know setting up for different side spins with the quad and been able to look at that so what he hit there a flyer lie is actually ideal in that situation you just have to figure out your distance differential because the wind's gonna now the wind will knock the ball down a little bit depending on its you know pure direction but um but anyways just wanted to talk about that now in regard to callaway so Callaway really, I mean, they've had golf ball since the rule 35 when they first came out. They've been in the golf ball market a long time, but they've been just kind of bumping in the single digits and 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 not very effective, you know, since since introducing the golf ball until the Chrome Soft. The Chrome Soft was their their big kind of foray into, you know, uh, successful golf ball marketing successful golf balls the the limitation of the chrome soft was always its velocity it was softer and so especially at higher club head speeds it didn't um it didn't perform as the other top urethane that's golf why ball. you didn't see tour pros playing it exactly for, for long stretches exactly. like they, they'd sign a deal with callaway but they'd play it a titleless golf ball or or a ball that they played in the past they wouldn't play yeah you're exactly right yep so um Callaway then hired Eric Loper and Eric Loper. I've known Eric since he, since he got in the business 20 odd years ago, maybe even longer. Jeez, that's depressing. Um, but, um, uh, he, Eric's a brilliant, brilliant golf ball designer. And he was behind the TP five series and he is, um, really, really smart and really intellectually curious. Loper comes over to TaylorMade. I mean, Callaway, from TaylorMade to Callaway. And he starts looking at taking the Chrome Soft to the next level. And that's what the Chrome Tour is. And it was interesting. Um, Mickelson teased like a year, year and a half ago, maybe even two years ago, 
Callaway's coming out with something special with golf balls. And now these golf balls take years to develop, but he had seen it and he had tested it in a prototype phase. And he knew the difference between that and the Chrome soft. I remember being intrigued by that. So Callaway reached out to me um, and I went up and observed the testing. We went through seven iron tour testing and tour driver testing. Now there's, when golf balls are tested, one of the, you can either put a golf ball randomly on a tee. People don't realize a golf ball has uh, two halves and it, and the way that they marry those two halves is they take a seam and that seam attaches the two halves. Now they've gotten really good. In the old days, you could actually line a golf ball up by its seam. Pro V1, original OG Pro V1. Exactly. Now, uh, it, I mean, unless you have a, I, I, like the worst thing I could do is a, a client will send me golf balls asking me to do this. It's called a seam pole test where you hit it on the seam in one direct orientation and then the other. And uh, nowadays it's just a nightmare to find the seam. I mean, they've gotten so good at manufacturing. That being said, the USGA still has this symmetry test where you have to hit the golf ball in one orientation and the other. And the golf ball can only have a certain distance differential between the two. The reason I bring that up is one of the things that we know in the industry and that a lot of golfers don't know is there's manufacturing tolerances in golf balls. Not every golf ball is the same. That's the reason that they they have this test. So we went up and, and I observed this test with Callaway. And what is interesting is their pole seam orientation they have uh, almost two and a half to three yards tighter um, distance control than their top competitor. So they are able to put more balls. And what does that mean as a golfer? If you hit the exact same shot twice in a row with two different golf balls, it's going to be two to three yards tighter than everybody else. Um, It doesn't sound like a huge amount, but in golf balls, that really is a big amount. And what that means is you are going to have a more consistent golf ball overall. They've um, they've done an amazing job as far as their ball velocity as well. Their ball velocity right now is right up there at the top. The golf ball, the 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 Chrome Tour has completely, in my mind, kind of transformed and moved Callaway from an interesting ball manufacturer company with the soft, the soft had some iterations and, and as you were saying, the X version was getting closer, but the tour version is, is on a different level. Do you, do you think, because I mean, people are going to hear two to three yards and go, I mean, that doesn't really seem like much, like, is, is this something that golfers, if you're say a 15 handicap or 15 to 20 handicapper, are you going to be able to benefit from, from seeing these improvements versus a guy that's like a, like a five is, is this kind of like a, an every, an every man improvement or is it more going to be for the guys that are a little more dialed in? Come on, man. (laughs) You know, it's like, dude, our whole podcast, our whole industry is selling hope. It's not selling like (laughs) you're going to be club champion. If you switch to this golf ball or this head or this shaft Everybody listening to this just wants hope. They want a little dangle out there just to go, oh, yeah, I think I'm going to try that sleeve out. That might make me a better player. Maybe I can qualify for the senior AM. I mean, you know, we're all delusional when it comes to this game. That being said, here's, here's my philosophy. But granted, I'm a little biased in what I do. But here's what I've realized. But if you're in the market for a urethane golf ball to begin with, you know, then why not try this one out? And and here's here's my rationale. When I go out and play golf, I don't want to think about my golf equipment. And I'm really fortunate that I've actually been able to specifically test my golf equipment. I know the performance characteristics. And when I have a miss, I know it's on me. I know it's not on the equipment. And so that helps me clear my mind but it was interesting. I remember, and it fascinated me about maybe seven or eight years ago. I'll be totally honest. I was, you know, I, I knock one into the, um, into a Canyon and I just went and grabbed a ball 
out of my bag and it happened to be a Callaway. It might even be the precursor to the soft. And I put it down and I striped a five iron my second shot, just striped it. And it didn't do what I wanted it to do. And I remember just thinking like, all of a sudden my trust in that product had had decreased because yeah. of that. And I knew that that was totally subjective and it was just one shot. And there could have been many different variables, but as golfers, I think what we want to do is just minimize um, thoughts of our equipment. That's, that's what you get fit for. That's what you go to the range for. But when you go on the course, you don't want to think about your equipment. And this is just one potential piece in which you wouldn't have to think about your golf ball, you know, if it was a flyer or if it went a little bit more right or a little bit more left. They've just, they've done a really good job of, uh, of tightening everything up. Yeah. I, I love that you're able to to put some numbers to these improvements because again, manufacturers will tell you that their golf balls are better. Um, but the great thing about the work that golf laboratories does is you're you're an independent. You don't care. You're just you're just there to test the product and uh, to take a look at the numbers. And so when like when we say on this podcast, like this golf ball is is actually really good. And I I will be the first to tell you. Anytime Callaway came out with a product before before Chrome Tour, Chrome, Chrome Soft X was was good, but it, you know Xander's ball was a prototype, and so it wasn't the same ball that you could that you could get at, at a retail shop. The, this is probably the first time where I've I've tested a Callaway ball, and I'm like, wow, this is this is actually a very good golf ball. It it's not it's it's strong off the tee. It, it always felt a little too soft for my liking. It's, it's gotten firmer over the years. So yeah, I, I think again, your numbers and what we've seen from Xander, I, I still think that, you know, if you look at it, titles is still King pro V one is still King, but Callaway's making some inroads. They really oh, are without a doubt. And yeah. what'll be interesting to see is, uh, how many tour players adopt this, you know, once that's a that's, great question, especially the guys that, that are free agents. Yeah, once that story gets out there and they yep. start doing testing in the off season, yep. and it, if you can see that that count rise, I, I mean, here's here's my advice to uh, to golfers: if you're price conscious but you're a sicko for this game, buy the cheapest urethane golf balls that you can. And 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 I'm not saying like no names, but whatever's on sale that's urethane buy it because the urethane will give you a lot more short game spin control than a Serling golf ball, which is the next category down from a price point. But, you know, if you're price conscious and just go, Hey, I don't want to spend 55, 60 bucks on a dozen, um, buy the cheapest thing. But if you're not price conscious and you're in the camp, like I was talking about formerly where you just don't want to think about your golf ball and you want to know that you've you know got one of the best golf balls give a look at the chrome tour obviously pro v1 is still there um there's a few others srixon makes an unbelievable product and then it's 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 really interesting uh i'll be totally honest i've done so much blind ball testing um i i can't figure out the human element of it but there's it's we did this test sound is feel and golf balls will have a slightly different sound. And for whatever reason, the pea brains of golfers get triggered by one sound versus another. And they like it because I look at it and see very similar performance characteristics. Sometimes you'll even see an advantage for the one that they don't pick, but they'll just be like, I like this ball. This ball gives me confidence. And there's something about that confidence. It's an X factor that I can't test for. So, you know, my recommendation, if you really want to examine golf balls, go buy a sleeve of two to three different types of golf balls. Go out on an afternoon when no one's there and drop two or three balls and hit them into greens. Hit them. It's your short game that's going to be your biggest defining factor. Yep. Most tour players, their money shot deciding whether or not they're going to go with the golf balls, a 40 yard wedge shot. They want to know how that ball flies, how it controls, how it lands. And they all, so, they all start around the green. Yes. That, that's yes, the thing. They start 100%. around the green and they work their way back. Yep. So yep. start short and then work your way back and um, yeah, and have fun. And you know, 
You might not agree with what we say on this pod. You may agree. We're just nobody saying, agrees with us on this pod. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair point. But um, but it's like test it and see, and ultimately, it's it's going to bring a little bit more enjoyment. And to be honest, it's kind of cool and fun because you're going through the same process that tour players do. And it's like, don't deny yourself of that. You have the same access that they do. You might not have, might not have access to prototypes but when they're in the off season they're doing exactly what you could potentially be doing as well yeah, yeah exactly oh 100 and i love that discussion because it's not just us saying hey xander's golf ball is really good like we're able to put some real meaty numbers to what makes that golf ball good and again just trying to, to help everybody out there as you're listening to this one of the toughest questions that i have to answer is when people say how do i conduct golf ball testing because it's not it's not like everything else. I tell people, you know, it's like you gotta you gotta feel what that golf ball feels like when you're out on the golf course. And it's tough to do it's tough to do ball testing when you've got a, a group behind you that's that's pushing you. And it's like you gotta you probably gotta get one of those early tee times if you can, or a late tee time so you can go out and test the ball on the golf course. Um, you know, test it if you've got a short game area at your at your local club or wherever you practice. Um, yeah, you can do you can do ball testing on a mat, but it just, it's not the same as being able to test it and, and feeling what that golf ball feels like going through the turf and coming off the golf club at impact. So, well, and, and, and I would say to that point, every golf, every range, not every range, but the majority of ranges have a short game area. Yep. And, you know, usually you should be 20 yards, cheat a little bit, go a little further back, you know, as far back as you can go without somebody yelling at you and, you know, up to 40 yards and do exactly what the tour players are doing. Hit off of grass, hit three balls of this type, you know, go buy three sleeves of golf balls, hit nine balls, pick them up, do it again. Do it with a 60, do it with a 54, do it with a 48, and see how that feels, see how that controls. Now, I'm gonna be honest, unless you're a single digit player, you're probably testing your swing more than anything else, you know? Yeah, <laughs> it's no kidding. Coming through. But, <laughs> But that Very good being, point. No, but that being said, hey, you're going to walk away and go, I feel confident in A or B or C. And then when you tee it up, that confidence hopefully will extend to the round and allow you to get a little bit more enjoyment out of this maddening game. Yeah. Speaking of golf balls, if you, you want to do some of your own golf ball testing after listening to Uncle Gene walk you through the best ways to conduct ball testing, head on over to Fairway Jockey. If you, if you go to the website, you're going to find they've, they've got literally every golf ball under the sun on their website that you can purchase. Uh, some of them that are actually for sale right now. So Fairway Jockey has you covered for balls. They've got you covered for golf bags, shafts, training aids, apparel. Man, I could go on and on. They even have a pre-owned section, which you know I understand that there's a like a budget-conscious golfer out there. And, and the pre-owned golf clubs on fairway jockey it's not a really extensive list but they do have some really good deals on not like products that you'd find from four or five years ago i mean i'm looking at their website right now and they have a a pre-owned odyssey ai1 milled three i mean those putters were were over 600 bucks initially and this one has the stability shaft so it's an upgraded version and you can get it for less than 500 so you're going to get some deals out there if you don't want to buy new but again if you do want to buy new they can customize it however you want i think that's one of the great things about fairway jockey is the fact that you're not just buying a stock offering if you want to buy it with a really high-end shaft because you know that's the shaft that you play and that's what you want to use in your new driver head have at it it's it's almost too much sometimes when i go through that website um as as a gear nerd, I'm like, oh man, they they do have it all, and then it makes me want to build my own driver and buy it. And uh, I definitely don't need another driver because my wife would probably divorce me if I got another driver. So uh, anyway, head on over to fairwayjockey.com if you want to learn more about all the products that they have on their website. And oh, by the way, if you go on over there and you make a purchase, make sure you enter promo code fully equipped. That's F U L L Y E Q U I P P E D to get ten percent off. Again, that's F U L L Y E Q U I P P E D for ten percent off. And thanks again to the Fairway Jockey for supporting the podcast. All right, Uncle Gene, one last thing before we get off for this week's episode: um, the Open at Royal Troon was the perfect opportunity to remember Todd Hamilton's two thousand four win. 
I mean, if you look at obscure major winners, Todd, Todd Hamilton might top the list. Um, I love it because there are guys who've won majors that just caught lightning in a bottle for one glorious week. And Todd Hamilton is definitely one of those guys. But the reason why I bring him up is because he used a golf club that week that I don't think, I'm sure if you're listening to this podcast, you got to know it. It's, it's the Sonar Tech MD Hybrid. Um, and Sonar Tech was one of those brands that they, they sort of like came on really strong they they had a lot of interest and and a lot of people clamoring for their products and then they just sort of like disappeared so if you go back um the products were first brought to north america by an entrepreneur in 2000 um, they were licensed under the sonar tech name but the technology was was actually licensed from a japanese company called royal collection and um i i look at it's funny and you've you've tested you know sonar tech because i asked you before the pod i'm like uh, man i'm gonna probably insult uncle gene's uh you know history because you've worked with literally everybody but sonar tech reminds me a lot of tour edge you know if you look at tour edge and and if you look at their product lineup they they do everything but fairway woods have always been an area for tour edge that they've really excelled in and it felt like sonar tech was kind of like before tour edge came along like sonar tech was that guy that created really good fairways and hybrids that seemed to resonate with a lot of the best players in the world. I mean, it wasn't just Todd Hamilton. I mean, David Duvall had a Sonar Tech fairway wood when he won the the Open in 2001. Nick Price was using it. I mean, you, you tested these, right, Uncle Gene? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And what's interesting about Sonar Tech is there's – it's it's interesting. There's been these brands. The first brand right when I got into the business was Olimar. Olimar was oh, yeah. Olimar was the greatest like success failure story of them all. Uh, Jesse Ortiz owned this company up in Northern California that made some persimmon woods, and uh, it's really interesting. I actually was just up in Lake Arrowhead. Um, this last weekend with Bruce McKinnon and Jennifer King, and they own KZG Golf. And uh, they were the ones, it was funny because every time I, I meet with them and socialize it with them, we recount the Olimar success slash tragedy. They were the ones that brought the the technology from Olimar to, um, to Jesse uh, for the fairway wood, the tri-metal. And I mean, the tri-metal was so successful and Olimar went from like a 2 million, I don't know, with less than $5 million a year company to over a hundred million dollar a year company overnight to the point that Ely sued them. And the inside word that I heard about the lawsuit was sued them to keep, he didn't care about winning the lawsuit. He wanted them to get their eye off the ball because they they became and it and it worked they became so consumed with the lawsuit that they um, that they didn't they didn't focus on their blocking and tackling um, the reason I bring them up they were the ultimate kind of uh, success flame out uh, tour edge has been consistent throughout they've had their like bumps but they've never had their flame out tour edge just keeps yeah keeps and I think I think more what I'm saying with like tour edge is like they are known for fairways. Like Sonar Tech was kind of the same way. Like they were, yes, they were known, they were yes. known for fairway woods, and like that's that's why you would generally gravitate towards their product. And I mean, a lot of the guys out on the Champions Tour use their use their fairways. Exactly, and and so Sonar Tech was in that same camp, and they were rising. The problem is, it is so difficult, and I, and it's almost alchemy to be honest with you. I. I've looked at so many different case studies and I can't draw conclusions other than the difficulty going from a one trick pony, a one club company to multiple clubs. It, it, there's almost, it's so difficult unless you have some overarching technology that benefits all clubs, which very rarely happens because irons are so different than fairway woods, hybrids, drivers, et cetera. It's so difficult to expand. And as you expand, you have a tendency of diluting. And as you dilute, if you're, if you're, you know, one of the stories I heard, this is years ago, um, and it's changed a bit, but, you know, Mizuno, I was talking to a designer, this is like 20 years ago, and he's like, we can't, 
we don't want to kill the golden goose which is the mp series you know right. and so so they were uh, japan was always hesitant to expand they're, they're changing that now and we've tested a lot of different mizuno products that now are for you know the mid and high handicap player that are beneficial but for so long they were resistant to do that because they were fearful that in doing that they were going to dilute what was their essence or their core and i think that's unfortunately what happened to sonar tech and 100 uh, percent, it was i mean that's you're exactly right they they couldn't keep up demand was was so high after after Todd Hamilton's win and, and seeing other pros put their their hybrids and fairways in play, they couldn't keep up with demand, and so because of that, they were you know you're, you're having these massive delays in delivering product to consumers. That frustrates consumers. There were also several, several issues. Um, they had a shortage of graphite shafts and even head covers, which is just crazy to me. Um, and then in an attempt to try and make up ground, that's when they started expanding into drivers and wedges, uh, and even clubs appealing to like the higher handicap golfers. And by that point they were, they were sunk and they were out of business in, in 2008. Uh, you know, they didn't even really last a decade in the industry. And again, as you mentioned, it's, it's, an, it's a cautionary tale because if you, if you're not able to, to meet demand, then you're usually going to get lapped by somebody. And this, this story actually reminds me a lot of, um, of Nike when they brought out Tiger's tour accuracy golf balls. You know, they, they're a company that they just really didn't ramp up. They didn't have the ability to ramp up demand like a Titleist. Titleist comes out later that year with the Pro V1. And because Nike's not able to, to scale up their ball business, they get beat to the punch by Titleist and Pro V1. And look what happens. I mean, Nike's no longer in business. And you do wonder. It's one of those what ifs. I mean, what if Sonar Tech had been able to to meet demand? Like would they would they still be in business? Would they would they be what tour edge is and when it comes to fairways and hybrids? Would would that be what they would be known for still? So it does make you wonder. You know, it, it was it's a again a cautionary tale. Yeah, hundred percent. And you know, it's What's, what's, what's interesting that, that from my perspective and working with a lot of these companies when sometimes they're out of a garage or little incubator or something like that is how success can ruin a company just as easily as kind of um, lack of sales. You know, lack of sales, you have to be creative and things like that. But sometimes success and growth ends up ruining a company and it's just it's wild and i'm kind of curious to see um you know kind of sitting back on the sideline watching like lab putter they're a classic one right now they're blowing up because For they sure you know and it'll be interesting i i don't know anything about their operation or anything but i'm just kind of sitting there watching going you know once again how do you navigate success you've got a mm -hmm. tiger by the tail you know and as we know, and we were talking about with the golf balls, especially these big OEMs, smaller ones have a little bit more opportunity. You know, they're more of a speedboat, so they can pivot as opposed to a super tanker. But still, the way modern supply chains are, you have to order, even for a small company, nine months a year in advance and forecast. And what's so insane about that, and the pandemic was a perfect highlight, no, like the pandemic came, Callaway laid off a decent chunk of their um, workforce because they were making an assumption that no one was going to buy golf equipment. Little did we know we were about to go through the greatest growth period of, of golf. The, the point being, no one has a crystal ball. No one, even the large manufacturers. And yet, as a small company, you've got to invest resources and, and bet on things that are 12 months in the future that you really have no control over. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a perfect spot to wrap a bow on episode 249, fully equipped. Wow. I would, I would like to say that the crew will be back next week, but I, I'm not going to make any promises because I don't really know. I, I truly believe that these guys are, are they're pissed off about something. And they just don't want, they just don't want to come back. That's fine. Uncle Gene and I will we'll we'll keep rocking it every week for as long as you'll have us. 
If you want more social goodness from us, always remember that we've got the social channels. We're at Fully Equipped Golf on YouTube and Instagram and at Fully Underscore Equipped on Twitter. Thanks all for listening. We'll see you next week. 